Hello everyone and welcome to Dutch Greybeard. This is going to be a different video than what you used for me. I'm not going to be talking about fantasy, but we're going to step away from the genre for about 15 minutes or so. I'm going to talk about two books that really got me thinking about the bigger questions. In the beginning of 2012, I read two books shortly after each other. More than other books usually do, they got me thinking on essential life issues. In January of 2012, I read this little book, The Problem of Pain, by C.S. Lewis. The writer most people will know for his magnificent Chronicles of Narnia. As you can see in these pictures, reading this book inspired me to write many asides on its pages and underline many sentences. Any book that provokes this many diary entries deserves closer attention. C.S. Lewis, at one point in his life, turned his back on his own atheism and became a Christian. Being a spiritually oriented agnostic myself, I am always intrigued by people who convincingly accept a religion as the ultimate truth. Let me start out by saying that I have no opinion whatsoever about anyone's faith or belief. Every person is free to believe anything she or he wants to. From my own point of view, I want to understand why people let dogmas and metaphors be their guide. I'm also fascinated by why Lewis turned his back on his own atheism and wholeheartedly embraced Christianity. In The Problem of Pain, first published in 1940, Lewis addresses in ten chapters the question of how it is possible that God, whom we humans like to see as good and all-powerful, allows his creations, humans and animals, to suffer pain. Let's, for the sake of argument, leave the vengeful and aggressive God from the Old Testament aside, shall we? Otherwise things will become very confusing. The God from the New Testament is full of love, compassion and forgiveness. How is it then that this almighty God allows his creation men to suffer so much. We suffer pain in a physical sense through violence, illness or bad luck, but we also suffer mentally through intense sorrow, unreasonable fear and loneliness, just to name a few examples. In short, why do we have to suffer if God is a God of love and mercy? In the extension of this problem lies the question about the meaning of life. To suffer is inevitable, it would seem. So what higher purpose does it serve? Being the convinced Christian that he was, Lewis goes out of his way to answer these questions from the perspective of Christian dogma. He is honest about his bygone atheism and even quotes a text of his own dating from before his conversion. He wrote, All stories will come to nothing. All life will turn out in the end to have been a transitory and senseless contortion upon the idiotic face of infinite matter. If you ask me to believe that this is the work of a benevolent and omnipotent spirit, I reply that all the evidence points in the opposite direction. Either there is no spirit behind the universe, or else a spirit indifferent to good and evil, or else an evil spirit. Lewis's sincere attempt to clarify the reasons behind the problem of pain in this book has my full sympathy, but his struggle to do so within the straight jacket of Christian dogma is almost painful to read. In his introduction, Lewis lectures on the elements that form the basis of a religious belief, like historical truth. About Jesus, he writes, either he was a raving lunatic of an unusually abominable type, or else he was, and is, precisely what he said. There is no middle way. In fact, Lewis states that historical accuracy about the life of Jesus has to be black or white, and grey is not an option. While, in my opinion, there is a whole rainbow of possible interpretations of the existence and life of Jesus. Another example of such straightforward thinking. The crucifixion itself is the best as well as the worst of all historical events, 
but the role of Judas remains simply evil. In several books I have read theories explaining that Judas acted as he did on Jesus' orders. Whatever the truth of the matter, it strikes me as remarkable that a great writer like C.S. Lewis categorically refuses to think outside the frameworks of the Christian dogma. Lewis also regards the Ten Commandments, which Moses is said to have taken down Mount Sinai, as historical truth. He does the same with more stories from the Bible, as if that book was actually quoted by God. The Bible may rightly be called the Book of Books, but I would argue that the historical accuracy of the stories described is questionable, to say the least. At the basis of his argument is the conviction that man is sinful. This, according to Lewis, we prove time and again with behaviour such as cowardice, greed, falseness and jealousy. Unless Christianity is wholly false, the perception of ourselves, which we have in moments of shame, must be the only true one. For Lewis, it is crystal clear that human suffering is connected to our sinful nature. And that, too, is an assumption that originates from Christian dogma, which, like any dogma, is the death knell of free thought. Some of Lewis's wriggling within the confines of his Christian dogma really annoyed me. Like his belief that man is superior to the animal kingdom. Man is to be understood only in his relation to God. The beasts are to be understood only in their relation to man and, through man, to God. Or, man was appointed by God to have dominion over the beasts. Love between father and son means essentially authoritative love on the one side and obedient love on the other. When I read a sentence like this one, I mainly see the limited and almost docile way of thinking set within the religious framework. Still, these annoyances didn't put me off. As indicated, I am genuinely curious about the background of a convert like C.S. Lewis. I try to understand his assertions and views with the same authenticity with which he presents them. The fact that I do not always succeed is due to my limitations or to the fact that his convictions are too much at odds with how I see and experience things. But there are also parts in it that make me very happy. In his Christian idiom, Lewis now and then emerges as the great writer he truly is. A man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the walls of his cell. This book left me with opposing feelings. The annoyance at the dogmatic way the author treats the subject matter and the admiration for his penmanship. I also can appreciate Lewis's courage in confronting himself with difficult questions. At the end of his argument, he explains that he only wants to investigate a number of pressing questions that are raging within himself. He actually applauds the fact that each individual has a different image of God. He expresses this in the following poetic way. If all experienced God in the same way and returned him an identical worship, the song of the church triumphant would have no symphony. It would be like an orchestra in which all the instruments played the same note. Now, that's profound and beautiful. For me, C.S. Lewis has not clarified the problem of pain. Pain as catharsis or purification sounds acceptable to me, like lessons learned in humility, charity or whatever. Although I'm quite sure that people experience pain without this catharsis at the end. For instance, people who slowly waste away as a result of a debilitating disease. In his book Winter Journal, Paul Auster describes the dying process of his grandmother on his mother's side. The disease that eventually killed her is known as ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It is a gruesome disease in which your body bit by bit paralyzes. In the final stage, the respiratory muscles are also affected and the patient slowly suffocates. 
Auster describes the horrible torture of his grandmother, who eventually also lost her mind. It's not easy to see any purification in this. It looks like someone suffers an indescribable amount of pain without any time left for purification, unless we accept the idea that death is not the end. Reincarnation could solve this problem of pain. For myself, I have to say that I simply do not know if reincarnation is real. I suppose my human brain power is too limited to grasp this unworldly concept. There is nothing that I can remember of past lives, nor is my earthly way of thinking capable of accepting any kind of proof. Nevertheless, it greatly interests me and I'm open to it. Although it may just as well be that after we breathe our last, there is nothing at all. One of the books that truly got me thinking about a continuation of our consciousness after life is There is a River by Thomas Sugru. It is not so much the book itself, but the fact that it introduced me to Edgar Cayce, as you can see on the cover. The title actually is There is a River, but you might think the title would be the story of Edgar Cayce. Edgar Cayce was a remarkable American medium. Up until that point, I had never heard of him, and I was skeptic, because I take spectacular stories about seers, mediums, or clairvoyants with a wheelbarrow of salt. Upon a strong recommendation by a friend, I read this book shortly after The Problem of Pain. The book was published in 1942, almost three years before Casey's death, and it tells us his biography. The writer, Thomas Sugru, received almost 80 so-called readings from Casey. Edgar Casey lived from 1877 to 1945. He was the son of a farmer. He grew up to be extremely religious, reading the Bible from the age of 10 at least once a year. At the age of 21, a respiratory infection made him lose his voice. An artist and hypnotist offered to cure him by hypnosis. During the hypnosis, his voice was immediately restored, but as soon as he came out of the hypnosis, the infection struck again. Somebody suggested that Casey describe his ailment himself during the hypnosis. In his normal voice, to everyone's surprise, he did just that. In medical terms, he described in minute detail what was wrong with him, and he gave an instant solution to cure it. And indeed, after the hypnosis, he was completely cured of his infection. That's how his special gift came to light for the first time. Afterwards, Casey could not remember any of the words he had spoken during the hypnosis, but he thought nothing more of it and was not all too eager to pursue it. A friend wanted to see if Casey could also diagnose other people under hypnosis. When persuaded to do this, the sleeping Casey told the subject, who suffered from stomach aches, in detail what was wrong with him. After following the suggested treatment, his stomach complaints had almost disappeared within three weeks. Edgar Cayce himself found all of it dubious and wanted to stop. His desire to be a disciple of Christ, helping people, and his friends persuaded him to set aside his doubts. And so began the new life of Edgar Cayce, who would give no fewer than 14,306 so-called readings from 1898 until his death in 1945. Casey was extremely frightened of saying something during his trances that could aggravate people's illnesses. He had, after all, no medical training whatsoever. He also regarded every reading purely as an experiment and refused to accept any money for it. Every of his medical readings were given in correct and technical terms of anatomy and physiology, and without exception his diagnoses were correct and his treatments all had positive effects. Nevertheless, Casey fell into a deep crisis. He was afraid that he was possessed by the devil. It took a lot of time and a lot of convincing before he finally could see that what he was doing 
was good. The fact that his readings saved a number of patients from certain death must have contributed to this. Until 1929, Casey refused to be paid for his readings. In that year, the Casey Hospital was founded in Virginia Beach. The hospital was funded by a wealthy and grateful recipient of readings. Casey was subsequently affiliated with that hospital as a professional seer. But before that, Casey earned his money as a photographer. There was always a lack of money in the Casey household, but his attitude towards his gift remained fundamentally unbusinesslike. When, for instance, he had to make a long journey to help someone, he only asked for the travel expenses. After 20 years of medical readings, someone asked him if he could also answer the question of what happens to a person after death. Casey had no idea. He had never asked himself such questions because he simply believed in the Christian afterlife with hosts of angels and the whole shebang. And so, from 1923 onwards, the so-called life readings began, of which he gave a total of approximately 2,500. A consistent picture of reincarnation emerged from these readings. He even named his own previous lives and also exactly which previous experiences had led to the kind of life he was now experiencing. This new turn plunged the deeply religious Casey again into a serious crisis. Just as at the beginning of his discovery, he went through a period of tortuous doubt about himself, about his faith, in short, about everything he had stood for up to that point. The whole idea of reincarnation was completely unknown to him before, let alone that he would believe in it. This, in very short, is the story of Edgar Casey, as told in There is a River. It caught me completely unawares, and I instantly started reading more about this remarkable man. So far, I have read about 15 books about or from Edgar Casey. The more I learned about him, the clearer his image became. He was a simple and honest man who wanted to do good and mainly wanted to give. His gift allowed him to do just that, even though he didn't understand it really. My acquaintance with Edgar Cayce made me think and rethink my own attitude towards reincarnation and things like the meaning of life. Not that I've come up with any answers. That is not what thinking and pondering has to result in, in my honest opinion. With his life readings, which are extraordinary indeed, Edgar Cayce has opened the door to, well, to anything really. The thought of being born again and again with the soul evolving is not preposterous anymore to me. As always, I am still left with many questions. What is that, a soul that is perfect? And who decides such things? And on what grounds? When did it all begin? And if there is indeed a beginning and end point, what was before? And what is after? Whatever the truth may be, we will no doubt find out. But with the advent of reincarnation as a serious consideration in my thinking, I have come considerably closer to a solution regarding the problem of pain. In her impressively good book, Many Mansions, Gina Cerminara describes theories about karma and reincarnation. I don't have a copy of this book anymore. I lend it to someone long ago and can't remember to who. Needless to say, I never got it back. Cheminara writes her theories on the basis of the readings of Edgar Cayce, among which there are some truly astonishing cases. To close this video, I would like to quote a passage from her book, in which she describes how the readings achieve a synthesis between science and religion. They, the readings, do so by showing that the moral world is subject to laws of cause and effect as precise as those that govern the physical world. Human suffering, they make clear, is due not merely to materialistic mischance, 
but rather to errors of conduct and thinking. The inequalities of human birth and human capacity do not arise from the capriciousness of the Creator or the blind mechanism of heredity. They arise from merits and demerits of past life behaviour. All pain and all limitation have an educative purpose. Deformities and afflictions are of a moral origin, and all man's agonies are lessons in a long-term school for wisdom and perfection. Thank you very much for watching this video. Until we meet again at Dutch Greybeard.